It's the Farmer to Farmer podcast, episode 168, and this is your host, Chris Blanchard. Karen Washington owns and operates Rise and Root Farm with Lori Clevenger, Jane Hodge, and Michaela Hayes. Located in Chester, New York, just a little over an hour from New York City, Karen and her partners raise an acre of produce to serve two New York City farmers markets. Karen shares the story of finding land for farming in rural New York State and how she and her fellow growers have made the transition from backyard urban gardening to commercial production. Karen digs into the nuts and bolts of how they address the social justice issues that are so important to them while still tending to the needs of their for-profit farming operation. We also discuss the challenges of and some strategies for communication and managing farm relationships with love and healing and how that's not always the easiest thing to do. The Farmer to Farmer podcast is generously supported by Farmer's Web, software for your farm. Farmer's Web makes it easier to work with your buyers, saving time, reducing errors, increasing your capacity to work with more buyers overall. Farmersweb.com. And by Vermont Compost Company, founded by organic crop growing professionals committed to meeting the need for high quality compost, compost based living soil mixes for certified organic plant production. Vermontcompost.com. And by BCS America. BCS two-wheel tractors are versatile, maneuverable in tight spaces, lightweight for less compaction, and easy to maintain and repair on the farm. They are driven and built to last for decades of dependable service. BCSamerica.com. Karen Washington, welcome to the Farmer to Farmer podcast. Thank you so much. Happy to be here. Really glad that you could join us today. Karen, I'd like to start off by having you tell us a little bit about Rise and Root Farm. Where are you guys located? How many acres of produce are you guys growing? And and where and how are you selling that? Yes, so uh, welcome everybody. So I belong to Rise and Root Farm. We are a woman-run farm. Lori, Clevenger, Michaela Hayes, and uh, Jane Hodge Hayes. Uh, We're located up in Chester, New York, which is an hour and 15 minutes from New York City. We're on three acres of land. Um, Currently, we are farming one acre, and the other two acres are being rotated and put into cover crop. And so we grow, the first year we were trying to grow everything, which is really crazy. We're entering our fourth year. So this year, we're we're starting to understand what the black dirt means, which is rich in, in nutrients. And so now we're focusing on growing heirloom tomatoes, edible flowers, flowers, and herbs. And uh, we service two farmer's markets. So we are at the Union Square Farmer's Market, which is located in Manhattan on 16th Street. We're there. And then we're located in the Bronx um, called the La Familia Verde Farmer's Market on Tremont Avenue in the Bronx. So those are our two markets, as well as selling to uh, restaurants. Yeah. That's us, Rise and Root Farm. Now, you said that you're entering your fourth year of farming now in 2018, but this is your fourth year of farming at Rise and Root Farm. You've been involved in agriculture for much, much longer than that. Yes. So I started um, through community garden work and also my backyard back in 1985 and really had no farming experience whatsoever. My parents weren't farmers. My grandparents weren't farmers. And so I just, you know, learned on the fly, basically by reading books and uh, going to the library. And then when I got involved in the community garden back in 1988, I was surrounded by a lot of people who had farming in their blood. So I learned a lot from them. And um, from my experience, as well as my partner's experience, We got a lot from working in our community gardens, a lot lot of hands-on work, uh, understanding where our food uh, was coming from, which is really, really important. And so we we decided that, you know, we would give give it a try and sort of move up into um, farming on a larger scale. And so that's where Rise and Root came into play. How did you make that transition from being a backyard urban gardener and working in community gardens to actually doing commercial production because you were doing, you were growing vegetables for sale while you were still in the city, right? Correct. 
So we were doing right. It was I was through my farmers market, the La Familia Verde farmers market. We developed what is called a farm cooperative, which we had five community gardens working together um, and producing um, food through those five community gardens. And we started that back in 2004. 2004. So um, looking at the potential of growing food um, on a small scale, we sort of also looked at the landscape of, of the food system in, in general and found out that the food that was in our neighborhood didn't compare to the food that we were growing in our community gardens. However, the food that we were growing in our community gardens wasn't enough. It was, it was small. And so thinking about how could we uh, take the idea around, especially around food and social justice that we were learning in, in, in the city, looking at the food system through the lens of hunger and poverty, how we could take that, that sort of vision that we all had and really enlarge it on a larger scale. And so uh, we all had the idea that we wanted to do that. We wanted to grow on a larger scale, but keep in mind, we also wanted to bring with us our vision and mission of food and social justice. And so uh, we got that opportunity of searching for land. It was hard. And we took a whole year going up and down Hudson Valley looking for land. And a lot of times it was prohibitive. The value of land is so, so expensive. And um, so there were many times when we just threw our hands up in the air and said, you know what? We, we won't be able to make it because we just can't find land that is reasonable. And I think this is a lot of, this is a problem that a lot of farmers, especially young farmers, are faced with today, the cost of land. And so we were lucky to, um, to meet a, 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 a gentleman, Steve Rosenberg, who was really, really instrumental in um, helping us find land up in Chester. What prompted the four of you to get together? and start a farm? I mean, I can answer that because in 2008, we went on a woman's retreat. So it was, believe it or not, it was 30 women who were on different aspects along the food chain. So some of us were farmers. uh, Some of us were activists. Some of us ran um, nonprofits. And so as women, all women, we decided to go to the Grail upstate and do a farm retreat for three days. And just talking about, you know, as women, what can we do to change the food system? What are our dreams? What are our hopes and and desires? And all of us talked about farming. All of us talked about farming. And then Jane, Lori, um, and Michaela, D and Maggie, we all decided, like, you know what? We want, you know, if this if this happens, we want to farm together. And so, um, Molly and I went to California, two thousand and eight, April two thousand and eight. We went to the Santa Cruz program, which is a six months program, living in a tent, learning how to grow organically. It's called Castus, the sense of agroecology and sustainable food systems. Uh, which really, really teaches you how to grow food on various scales. So it's a farm scale, it's an urban farm scale, it's an orchard scale. And when we came back, you know, we we had farming in our blood. And so the time was right where I was retiring from physical therapy. Jane was um, um, retiring from uh, being the ED at Just Food. Michaela was just starting her crock and jar. Um, business and Lori was just coming back from Castus that she spent two years. So it just seemed that the stars were aligned for all of us and Dee and Maggie as well. They were about to leave their jobs out in um, working out at Eco Station in Brooklyn. That it, the timing was right. That you know what? Uh, let's follow our dream. Grow NYC. The Farms Beginning Program, which is an excellent program, was very instrumental in us figuring that out. So what the Farms Beginning Program helped us do was to think about a mission, think about a vision, and then think about dreaming big. And then also what they had for us is to think about, all right, so if you want to farm, what does that take? It's a budget, um, how capital, um, how to manage the farm, 
what are your strengths, your weaknesses, your opportunities, your, your threats? Um, it was a very, very, it was an excellent program. Um, that was a six month program. And what, at the end, it was about dreaming big. What is your vision? And so, you know, as I look back on what our vision was, and to, when we took the Farms Beginning program in 2012, we had all said by 2014, we will have land, which we have, that we will be farming together, which we're doing. Um, and so I think for any farmer that's out there that, that wants to think about farming, you have these tools. If you're in a city, you have the Growing YC Farms Beginning program that can really help you flush out. You know, what is it that you want to do in terms of farming? And then we tell people, you know, to go to many places as you can and tell people what you want. Tell people that you're looking for land. And so we were lucky to be able to continue to put that message out that we were looking for land and someone heard it. And so um, an advice for any new uh, farmer to be is that don't keep your hopes and dreams inside. You know, shout it out because there might be someone out there that um, is out there to hear it and willing to help you. Well, and that seems like something that you've talked about a lot over the course of your career about about engagement with community. But I mean, I would. OK, and, and maybe I'm maybe I'm I'm casting stereotypes here, but. It seems like not an easy thing to do for four women, two of whom are black, to go into a a rural community that's largely white and say, hey, we want to buy land to have a vegetable farm. Yes. And so that's why we had two white women who are allies. Yes, there is that stereotype that's out there. Yes, there is. This race is definitely in the equation um, in the food system, which is predominantly white male oriented. Um, but you know what, um, the bottom line at the end of the day, even when we went up to Chester, our first year of farming, there were farmers who sort of laughed at us behind our back because we took the principles of, you know, putting raised beds, um, doing drip irrigation, because if you look at the history of the black dirt region, it was, it had so much moisture and so much organic matter that at times they were getting rid of water and that putting drip irrigation. But because of climate change and things that are changing, you know, we started to do raised beds um, and also to do drip drip irrigation to help with conserving, conserving water, using mulch. And at first, you know, farmers said, look at these, you know, women, you know, who had the history of, you know, growing in cities and now they're bringing their practices up here. But when they saw what we were growing and they saw our work ethic, our hard work ethic, at the end of the day, they sat back and they really admired uh, what we did. And so, you know, we were, you know, they just took us in as, you know, just other farmers, because I think at the end of the day, they saw how hard we work and that how, how we work in terms of being stewards of the land and how we cared about what we were growing, intentional using organic practices and what we were doing. Um, <clears throat> and so I think we, we definitely gained the respect of, 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 of a lot of the farmers. And then during the second and third season, when we started growing our heirloom tomatoes, especially in the high tunnel, a couple of farmers would come in and say, wow, you're growing the best tomatoes. Can you teach us how to grow hood tomatoes in high tunnels? So at the end of the day, it's really about working community. So at the Chester Agricultural Center, we have four farms. Um, and even though the four farms are independent farms, we do work cooperatively. And that means that we share the greenhouse. We share our common ideas, successes, failures. We share each other's equipment. And so, I, again, I would advise future farmers to think about working in community, which is really, really important, because then farmers learn from each other, and then you learn to respect the work ethics that all of us are, are doing. So, again, another piece of advice, if you can, 
um, work cooperatively with farm with other farmers, it's a plus because you learn a lot. Um, I think any farmer that says that they are an expert, um, I tend to um, disagree with that because I feel that the only expert is Mother Nature, and Mother Nature will tell you uh, right from the start who's the boss. So tell me about Chester Agricultural Center. That's that seems like an interesting idea to me because the way you described it, it doesn't sound like it's an incubator program in the sense that it's meant to to funnel people through, but it sounds like more of a a land access initiative. Yes, the Chess Agricultural Center was formed by investors, so there are numerous investors that came up to Chester to purchase land with the hopes of really helping beginner farmers. And so how it works is that you lease the land, you lease the land, and up in Chester where we are, which is in the Black Dirt region, where the land is extremely, extremely um, rich with organic matter, um, we're leasing the land um, for about four, four fifty, four eighty an acre per year. Um, and for that, for us, it's reasonable. There's infrastructure there already. So we also lease the infrastructure, the greenhouse that's there. We have a cooling barn that's, that's, that's there. And so, uh, and we also pay rent on that. We lease, um, that as well. But if you look at the cost for young farmers to lease land in the Hudson Valley, we were at one place that it was, you know, we went to a meeting one time and the guy was saying how, you know, the closer you are to, to New York City, the, the more expensive land is. And he was talking about land being like 50000 to over close to a million dollars an acre. And most of that is close to the city. And most of that cost is for, you know, celebrity um, people that have the money that want to quote, you know, be on farmland, they're really not farming. Um, so that was sort of saddened to, to hear that. And then we would go up along the Hudson Valley and there were costs of 200000 you know, an acre. And then there were, you know, some places that we would go on that they really didn't know the soil structure um, in terms of the ability to, to grow vegetables. And then there were some quirks that, you know, some people wanted us to farm their land. However, they had family members on the land and they, you know, you know, we could farm for free, but we had to make sure we took care of the family member. And there were a lot of quirks along the way. But again, you know, we went out there and we traveled and we visited farms and we listened to people. And, and, And again, all the while, just putting out there, we're looking for land, we're looking for land. And like I said, it was really Steve Rosenberg from um, Scenic Huston, who I happened to be sitting next to on a tour of the Hudson Valley. And, you know, he said, you know what, I I may have uh, someone that you need to speak to at the Chester Agricultural Center. Now, folks, I know many times you're getting leads and after you have been searching for so long and you, all of a sudden someone gives you another lead, there's two directions that it goes. The first direction is that, well, you know, I've been trying, 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 and it's really getting expensive, you know, so why should I, you know, call this person to for them to tell me again that the land is so expensive, it's so far away. And then there's the other voice that tells you, you know what, give it a try. You have nothing to lose. and at first, you know, you're afraid, but you know what? We decided to call. We called, um, spoke to the guy at the time that was running the Chester Agricultural Center. He told us to come up to Chester, meet, meet him at a diner. So we all went up at a diner. He took us to show us the lay of the land. Um, we met some of the, the, the next meeting, we we're, were meeting some of the farmers uh, that were up there. And sitting down and listening to the other farmers that were going to be in this project, 
um, and listening to their work ethics that, you know, they were stewards of the land. They believed in um, organic practices. Um, we talked about our vision of food and social justice in terms of why we want to grow food is to make sure that everyone has the right to the food that we're growing. Um, being intentional about looking at farm labor practices um, to making sure that people are treated who work on the, on the farm, regardless if it's our farm, but in the Chester Agricultural Center as well, that the workers are treated hu humanely, that they're, they're giving a living wage, uh, uh, a living a wage in terms of, 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 of how they're being paid, how they're being treated. And so by having that conversation, we right then and there, we knew we were in the right spot. That's a special thing to have that right spot in your community and to, to be uh, surrounded by people who are doing the same thing that you're doing with the same mission and goals as what you're doing. Because a lot of times I hear from growers about how isolating it can be to be an organic vegetable farmer out in a sea of conventional agriculture. You can say that again. And we we hear those stories and it doesn't, it, you know, a day doesn't go by where we feel lucky and inspired. And, um, you know, during the winter time when, you know, the snow is covering the ground, you know, and then all of a sudden you see spring is right around the corner, you're itching, you know, to go back on the farm to be in that community. Right now we are all working in terms of community to build a, a uh, another high tunnel. And again, it's taking the work of all of us, all of the four farms that are up there to, to put the tables, to build the tables that are going to be needed in the new greenhouse. And so, again, it's working in community, um, finding out, you know, what went well last year, what are some of the, the best practices that we can do this year. And another thing that we do, and again, farmers uh, that are listening, very, very important to, to look at self-care. I think what we do as a farm collectively is that on the weekends we would take time off and go bowling. You know, we would bowl together. We would have cookouts together. Um, and so to really understand that the work of farming is labor intensive, but also you have to put into your farming attitude the realm of self-care. Because if you don't have self-care, you're going to burn out. And so you have to put in, and you have to, I know it's hard, but you have to put time where you are surrounded by family and friends and you do something that's completely different from farming, going to the movies together, we do that. Go bowling together, we do that. Having barbecues together, we do that. Some, or, you know, Jane and McKeel have kids and sometimes the farmers babysit. And so... You have to have that realm of self-care so that you can then go back to, number one, appreciate the fact that you are in a community of farmers, that you're helping one another, and that, two, you have a better appreciation of the farming work that you do. Because at the end of the day, you have people that have your back. You know, you have people that have your back. And it just makes more humane the, the work that you're doing instead of just thinking that, you know, you're working at the farm constantly, 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 and you never take time to sit back and heal yourself, um, heal your body, you know, heal who you are in community and really appreciate the love um, that you get from the people that you that you work with. Well, and that was something I wanted to ask about. You mentioned earlier that you had a background in physical therapy and that, in fact, you had retired from that in order to start the, to start rise and root farm and how that influenced your farming. Are there other ways that your background in physical therapy has, has influenced your farming practice? Yes. Uh, looking at, uh, definitely, um, treating my patients who were in their seventies and eighties who had farming backgrounds. So I had patients who were from the Caribbean, from Latin America, who are from Europe. And most of them, had farming backgrounds, either they farmed or their parents farmed. And now at the age of 70 and 80, they're relegated to processed food, fast food, junk food. They have type 2 diabetes, hypertension, hypertension 
or obesity. And now the treatment is not a not a really change in diet, but the treatment was medication. And so what I would do is that, first of all, I was a physical therapist. I was a holistic physical therapist. That means that even though I was a hands-on therapist, if I was going to treat my patients, I had to, number one, look at what medication they were using, and number two, what were they eating? So I would go into their house on my first evaluation, not only look at their medication, but go into their refrigerator and cupboard and say, okay, you know, you know you're a diabetic or you're hypertensive, you're hypertensive, what are you eating? Anything that said had, had end fructose, glucose, any of the O's at the end meant sugar. So I look at the food and anything that had sodium in it that meant salt and for them to look at what they were eating. And then I would, when we would have our farmer's market, I would sneak and bring them fresh fruits and vegetables and say to them, this is what you're eating. And they would tell me, oh, Ms. Washington, you know, farming is so hard. And I said, yeah, but do you remember how food tasted? And then once I would bring that recollection of how they didn't go to the supermarket, how they got everything fresh from the farm, the eggs, the fruits, the vegetables, they would sit back and they say, Ms. Washington, you're absolutely right. The food was so much fresher, so much healthier. My parents lived till they were in their 90s to 100. You know, they hardly ever saw a doctor. And so having that conversation with my patients made me locked in the relationship between food and health. And that the best medicine wasn't a prescription of pills, but the best medicine was the correction of their diet, what they were eating. And so, you know, as I sort of distanced myself from my field of physical therapy, which I loved, I loved my, my profession. I did that for 37 and a half years. But what I found with the medical profession is that the emphasis was always on treatment, 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 more medication, more medication, more medication, and never on prevention. And so for me, I looked at farming as a tool of prevention, of growing food and getting people to understand the correlation between food and health. And that if you ate healthy, then you would not have some of the diet-related diseases that you have now. And so that also pushed me towards uh, advocacy and activism, living in a low-income neighborhood and seeing the the, the food system and where I lived that was surrounded by fast food, junk food, and processed food, and then having to, again, take that on and educate the people in my neighborhood to understand where their, first of all, where their food was coming from, not from the grocery store, but from a guard from the ground, from the earth, and getting them encouraged to want to grow food and be into the, be into gardens and understand the relationship between food and health. How has that perspective influenced the ways that you've chosen to market the produce from Rise and Root Farm? So very um, excellent question, because first of all, to educate people, the fact that we are four farmers, like you said, two of us are women of color. We're all women. Some of us are LGBTQ women. And to put that out, First of all, so people can see who we are as farmers, because again, the farmer is white male. And so for when Lori and I would go to markets, people will assume that we were the help, that we weren't the farmers. And so to, to number one, to educate people, the fact that, yeah, we're women, we're black women. And yeah, we are the farmers. We are the owners of Rising Roof Farm to educate them because of the stereotype or the assumption. Um, that's number one. And also to have people understand that we are a farm and that we do accept WIC coupons, health bucks, and so that even though we may be at, on one point we're at um, 14th Street Union Square, and the other time we're at the farmer's market in the Bronx, that we, we are reaching out to all people because as part of our vision and part of our mission is that Everyone, no matter their ethnicity, no matter their income, 
everyone has a right to the food that we grow. And so it's not based on high end. You know, we're not growing food for high end. We're growing food for community. And that, that whatever the high end restaurant is paying for our heirloom tomatoes or our edible flowers or our herbs, the people in the Bronx are, are, are privy to the same heirloom tomatoes, the same edible flowers, the same herbs that um, high end people are, are getting as well. And so we want to make sure that people understand that, that the food that we grow, everyone has a right to, to, to purchase it. And everyone has a right to eat it. And we want to make sure that's, that that's clear of who we are as farmers. So do you charge different prices for your food in different marketplaces? Yes, we do. So, um, yes, because again, we are for profit farm, but, Even though we are in the Bronx and it's a, quote, a low-income neighborhood, there is a price for our food. You know, there's a price for our food. And and farmers that are out there, you know, you really have to educate a lot of consumers, especially if you are in low-income neighborhoods, that there's a cost and value for you as a farmer and for your time and for what you're bringing down. Now, I say that because in many low-income neighborhoods, you're surrounded by a charity food system, a charity food system that is doing an excellent job in stemming the tide of hunger and poverty. However, we have to understand that the charity model of providing food through soup kitchen and food pantry, the great job that they're doing, is supposed to be for emergency purposes. And so when you have people that are relying on that food system and uh, coming to a farmer's market, sometimes that idea of food is supposed to be free or food is supposed to be low cost figures into that mentality. So what I've found in the 15 years that we've been working at our farmer's market is to educate people the value and cost of food. For example, So we have, you know, we bring in our carrots. So our carrots are $2 a bunch. And so when a customer comes up and says, well, you know, why am I paying $2 a bunch for your carrots where I can get it from the store down the block that's wrapped in cellophane for 99 cents? Or I just got a bunch of carrots from the food pantry. So I have to explain to that customer that these $2 carrots that I have in my hand, I'm the farmer. I grew it. I put the seed in the ground. I took care of it. And I brought it down 50 miles so that you can have it fresh. I, you know, I put them, pull them up from the ground this morning, brought them down, and I'm the farmer who grew it. Now, that 99 cent bunch of carrots that's wrapped in cellophane, number one, you don't know who grew it or how the farmer that grew it was treated. Was it sprayed with pesticide or insecticide? How long was it stored either either on a a freight train or a a tractor trailer? But I can tell you that I'm the farmer that grew it. I use no pesticides or insecticides, and I'm bringing it to you fresh. That way, the customer says, you know what? I want something that's fresh. I want to meet the farmer that grew it, and I'm willing to pay to two dollars for that carrot, and that and that is about educating. And so now the farmers market that we have in the Bronx is going into its fifteenth year, and so we build a customer base that understands what they're paying for. They're paying for the farmer's time, they're paying for the farmer's effort, and they're paying for a quality vegetable that they're that they're paying for, and having that conversation. Um, within within community, especially low in communities, is a win 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 for us. Is a win 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 for for the consumer, and so it takes a lot of education. But people want to be able to pay for something that is healthy, and knowing that it's that that that, that money that they're paying for helps us to stay in business, helps us to come down fifty miles, you know, once a week to provide this. 
people understand that. Now, I'm not saying all people understand it because there's some people that say, Ms. Washington, I understand it, but I'm on a budget. And if I could afford it, I would. But they understand, they understand that I am a farmer bringing food down and that there's a cost and value of the food that I'm bringing down for you to eat. And so I think a lot of us miss that opportunity of talking to people about the cost and value of food and making them understand as a farmer, we're workers, you know, this is our income, you know, we're, we're trying to pay bills, you know, put a roof over our head, provide for our family, and there's a cost in that. And so to educate the consumer to understand that, you know, we're trying to make a living like, you know, just like you're trying to, to make a living, that there's a cost in that. And that the food that we're bringing down is not free. You know, it's not low cost. That there is a cost and a value to the food that we're bringing down. So how do you decide how much you're going to charge for your produce in different markets? Well, the thing is, is that, um, well, you look at what your, you know, what other people are charging at other stands. You, you look at, you know, you hear what, you know, other farmers are charging, depending on the community that they, they that they have their farmers market in. They all you also look around, you know, the various stores, the supermarkets, and other um, vegetable stands, and see what they are charging, and um, really looking at that price, and um, knowing that you know what you're going to up your price a little bit more because of the fact that. You know, you're bringing a product that's organically grown. You're bringing a product where the consumer is, is meeting the farmer that's growing it. Um, and so you base a lot of your the margin on, on that, on what other farmers, you know, in, uh, in, in terms of the farmer's market, what are they charging um, for the same product you're bringing down? And then comparing that with um, what is being sold at local um, grocery stores or vegetable um, stores. And sometimes, let me tell you, the customers will tell you, like you say, you know, they, like I told you, you know, they would say, you know, I got, you know, collard greens are 79 cents a pound. How come yours is, you know, $2 a pound, you know? And then sometimes, you know, what another hook that we do sometimes is that for, for uh, customers that are somewhat skeptical about, you know, purchasing, we will give them, like, say, full of heirloom tomatoes. Our heirloom tomatoes are, you know, priced in a low-income neighborhood. We will charge $3 a pound for an heirloom tomato, um, whereas maybe at, um, at um, a high-end uh, market, you may charge 6 to $8 a pound. But you know what we do? Sometimes we would say, you know what? Here's an heirloom tomato. Take it home. Come back. And they will come back and say they've never tasted anything like that, and they're willing to pay that price. Same with our eggs. So we have we sell eggs because um, my garden, the garden of happiness, we have chickens. So we sell our eggs four dollars a dozen. Now, that's compared to ninety nine cents that you will find at the local grocery store. Um, so like at Sea Town or Farm Fair, eggs will go maybe. a 99 cent a pound or $1.99 cent a pound, or in some cases, they may even get them free at, um, at a food pantry. So when we say $4 a dozen, you know, the customer is saying $4 a dozen. So this is what we do. We say, okay, take two, take, take here. We're going to give you these two eggs. Take them home. We cannot, we cannot even keep our eggs. Right now, people are like signing up, you know, in the back of their head because they now they've tasted our eggs, and now that's the first thing that sells out our eggs is you know once you get people a chance to taste the quality, the quality of what you're bringing down cannot compare to what they're getting at a local grocery store. So that when they say you know what I'm spending seventy seventy nine cent a pound or ninety nine cents a pound for your college, and you're charging you know. $2, there's no comparison, no comparison into the taste, no comparison to how it looks, how it stands up. And so, again, 
you have to base as farmers, you base it on your your effort, your time, your value as a farmer, and make sure that the consumer understands that. They understand your time, they understand your value, they understand um the time that you, you know, that you've taken to, to bring a good product, a great product, uh, down to, um, for people to, to buy and to people to eat. Pa- people will pay for quality. Well, and it seems like part of when you talk about paying for quality, part of what you're helping people, part of what you're helping your customers understand is that an egg isn't just an egg, that there's, there's more to it than just, than just its, its eggness or its ability to fit into a recipe, that there's, there's a whole other set of qualities around being an egg or being a carrot. Correct. And also, also is great. Another good point is to invite people to come to your farm. They want to see, you know, you want to see where you get the eggs from. There's five community gardens. You can see where we get our, our produce from. You want to see where you get those carrots, where you get those collars, where you get those tomatoes. There's Rise and Root Farm. We're an hour and 15 minutes away from New York. And believe it or not, people do come. It gets so hectic at Rise and Root that we have now um, community days. So the last uh, Saturday of the month, starting in uh, May, we have community days because we had to control people coming up randomly to visit the farm, you know, once we put that invitation out there because it takes away from our work. And so now we have allotted time so that we can manage visitors that the last Saturday of the month from March up until October, you go online, let us know that you're coming. And from 10 to one is a community day where you got a chance to visit the farm, to um, get your hands dirty. If you want to help out, you know, planting, pulling up weeds, or just have a place where you can just get away. You know, one thing about our farm is that whenever there was a tragedy, you know, we would open up our farm. If you need a place where you need to come and heal, especially what happened at the Pulse nightclub, um, back in, in Florida a couple of years ago where the LGBT community felt so, so wounded. We opened up our farm and we told people, if you need to come up and heal, a place for healing, a place to, to be in community of, of, of spirit, of, of, of community, come on up. And a lot of people came up to our farm just to sit in community, just to look along along the horizon and see the beauty of the farm and feeling that healing quality that a farm can, can bring. And so, you know, that's one aspect of our farm that we love too. We put it out there, you know, um, if you need time just to get away, to be in a moment of, of, of comfort, that's what a rising roof farm is all about as well. And so there are people that come up during community days that just need a place to, to, to just to get away, you know, to bring their family, to see where food is grown, but most of all, to see how beautiful um, the landscape is. And if you need that, that time of solitude, that our farm can give you that, that time of solitude as well. So it's not always about growing food, but also about providing a place where people can need that sense of healing. Um, that we provide, which is important. I love that. I think that is so important and such a valuable resource that you're providing to your community. Mm-hmm. You mentioned the Garden of Happiness. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, so that's my roots, the Garden of Happiness. So the Garden of Happiness was started, as a matter of fact, this is our 30th year. It's a community garden that I help um, found along with my community residents on in 1988. It was uh, a, a vacant lot, one of 10,000 vacant lots in New York City, if you could believe that. And um, again, had no farming experience, but really, really saw 
the ills of empty lots and, 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 and garbage filled lots because I had moved into a brand new community, a brand new house back in 1988. And that lot was supposed to be an additional homes. But when the developer got there, he left it. And so for the first three years of living in a brand new community, right across the street was an eyesore. And so, you know, you would hear the, the words and words can be very, very painful that people would say, you know, they would call us garbage. You know, I look at this, look at these people, they live in garbage, they live in filth, you know, they're nothing but pigs. And the fact that we weren't, and we would clean that empty lot up. And then in the middle of the night, wake up and find it was filled with abandoned cars and tires. And so um, it just took resilience of people to get together to turn that empty lot into a community garden. And we were one of the first projects of the New York Botanical Garden, the Bronx Green Up uh, program that helped turn that um, empty lot into a community garden. And so for me, at first, it wasn't about growing food, but it was about growing community and beautifying the neighborhood. And once people started to see that the empty lot had changed into flowers and 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 bushes and shrubs and trees and how beautiful that garden started to look it changed the whole outlook of uh, of that community and for me i started to being in that garden started to learn about the isms that were plaguing our um our community and our society the the racism of uh, institutional racism and structural racism and environmental racism that you would commonly see in low-income neighborhoods and neighborhoods of color and learning that. And then also learning, you know, starting to get my activism together and understanding that growing food wasn't enough, that growing food intersects so many social identities that were going out there. I mean, we had problems with um, unemployment, um, asthma, um, uh, you know, um, no heat and hot water in a lot of uh, the apartment buildings and sort of learning all that that was intertwined into that garden, hearing people unable to afford medical treatment, you know, were out of work, huge immigration population in our garden and that having um, the rights to citizenship. And so this is what molded me. You know, this is what I heard in my community and instead of being complacent about it, really get involved in activism and, 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 and bucking the system and calling out the injustices that I saw and making it known to a lot of the politicians that were happening in, in my community and, and setting up meetings and meeting with them to say what was happening in our community was wrong and that change had to happen. And so for me, I learned a lot and I continue to learn from my community as I continue to live here in the Bronx, even though half of the time I'm living up in Chester, but you know, two days out of the, the week during the farming season, I'm here, you know, I'm here in the Bronx and I'm here in the Bronx during the winter time. So I continue to um, be passionate about my activism work about ending the tide of hunger and poverty, of making people understand that everyone has a right to good food, um, to talk about, uh, to change the, the lens of how people look at people who are, are in poverty and to change the lens of people not looking at us in terms of needs and problems, but looking at us in terms of assets and, and, and solutions. Because in order to be poor, you have to be strong because in essence, you make, you know, you make something out of nothing. You, you're handed nothing and you make something out of it. And so, 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 so people to change that lens of what it is to live in, in, in poverty, to change the lens of what um, it is to um, be in, in a low-income neighborhood. Um, and I try to tell people time and time again, and I put it out, and hopefully I put it out in your, sh your show to, to make people understand, is that all we want, you give people the resources, the tools, the capital, the ability to own businesses, 
to be entrepreneurs, you will see how that changes the whole landscape of low-income neighborhoods. I say for I think for too long we have looked in terms of needs, and as a result, is always well, what can we, you know, what can we give? The handout, the handout, the charity mentality. And I tell people, don't give us a handout, give us a hand in. You know, share your power, share your resources. And if you do that, then people who were once deemed powerless now become powerful. And so I tell people out there that have power, that have resources, that they need to to share it or give it up. And it's hard to do because power is a drug. It's hard to do. So this is one of the talks that I I talk to you know people about. It's about sharing, giving up power, and, sh- and sharing, giving up resources. Um, and that's hard to do when you, so many people have been in power for so long. Now all of a sudden you want to see people who have been impoverished. You want to share that power. You want to give them resources so that they have the equity to do what you're doing. Have the equity and the ability now to have their own businesses, to be self-sufficient and self-reliant. Um, yes, that's, that's difficult for people to see, especially um, to see people who are, who are black and brown all of a sudden obtaining power and being to be on their own. Um, it can be a scary thought for people who have been in power for so long. But believe it or not, that's the, the way it's going to go. I mean, sooner or later, um, people who have been uh, denied power are going to to either either you share or they're go- it's going to be taken. So um, sooner or later, the tide will change uh, and people will become more powerful. So when you talk about sharing power, sharing resources, how do you affect that with? with your community from Rise and Root Farm? Well, I think we do that in a number of things in terms of our work ethics, so that we have people in community that come up and work on our farms. You know what? You don't know who their economic status is. You don't know who, you don't know their educational status is. You don't know their immigration status. And you have a group of people working together, especially during our community days, and the intention is that they're working together to help us on the, on the farm. And so it's getting people to understand that there is no difference. You know, I mean, there's the person around you could be homeless or could be poor and the person next to you could, you know, have affluence. But yet they're there working together. And so what we try and so when we talk about our farm and we introduce you know, our mission and vision on our farm, we make people to understand that, you know what, you could be next to a person who is affluent, you could be next to a person who is poor. And the bottom line is that we're all working here in community. And if we can work in community in our farm, then how, then we can also change the social status that, that, that's having, that we're having in, in, in our world where we, we're starting to have a system of the haves and have nots. And making people understand that, you know, that when you do have um, affluence and you do have resources, how better it is to try to share it to those that don't have. And so what Rising Root Farm does is to lay that foundation whereby when we have our community days and people come up, is, is we always invoke that sharing mentality of people going around and talking about the work that they do and then finding ways that, you know, that if there is ability to share, that um, they can share. They can share their resources, that they can, you know, be involved in what people are doing. And all there's always lessons learned. Um, When people leave the farm, there's always lessons learned about themselves, but also about people in other communities, which is really, really good. With that, Karen, we're going to stop here, get a quick word from a couple of sponsors, and then we'll be right back with Karen Washington from Rise and Root Farm. The Farmer to Farmer podcast is brought to you by Farmer's Web, software for your farm. 
Farmers Web makes it easy to work with your buyers, saving you time, increasing efficiency, reducing mistakes, and streamlining order management. Farmers Web helps you manage orders from buyers who place them online, as well as those who order by phone or by email. Use Farmers Web to generate a product catalog for buyers, allow your buyers to review your real-time availability online, and create harvest lists and packing slips for your orders. Farmers Web helps you inform your buyers of delivery routes, pickup locations, lead times, and more while helping you keep track of special pricing and customer information. You can also download detailed financial reports. Farmers Web offers a free account type and a flat monthly fee on paid plans. You can pause, cancel, or switch plan types at any time. Check out a demo video and Farmers Web guide to working with wholesale buyers at FarmersWeb.com. And perennial support for the podcast is provided by Vermont Compost Company, makers of Fort B and Fort Light potting mixes. When you're growing transplants, all of the investments you made in plant materials, heat, labor, and overhead depend utterly on the performance of the media where you expect your plants to grow. And if you're an organic grower, you're probably using a media based on compost, and you should be looking for the best compost. Most organic potting soils have two basic parts, the compost and then everything else. And at Vermont Compost Company, Carl Hammer and his crew are very intentional about the inputs they use in their compost. While they're making use of waste products, waste disposal is not their primary goal. Ingredients are sourced consciously and with the end in mind. The same goes for the everything else part. Like the best in art, everything in Vermont compost potting soils has a purpose, whether it's the chips of ocean blue granite or the kelp that provides micronutrients and a little smell of the ocean. Fully composted compost, top quality ingredients, and a real sense for the art and the science of plant production combined with a real commitment to organic growing professionals to create a consistent product year after year. And in something that's subject to as many variables as market farming, it's nice to have something you can count on. VermontCompost.com. And we're back with Karen Washington from Rise and Root Farm in Chester, New York. So, Karen, just before the break, you were talking about working in community. And you were talking about this in this larger sense of, of working with community members and having them participating in the, in the farming and gardening operations. But you guys also are managing this farm in community. There's four of you working together and, and I've, I've farmed alone and I farmed in a partnership and, and I know that those two things are, are different, but, but my partnership was just with one person. And I, I'm, I'm always amazed when I hear about people like four people all farming together. How do you guys, how do you guys divvy up the work? How do you guys make decisions and how do you just, make it all work without being in a constant state of commotion. <laughs> well, let me say something. It, it's difficult, but difficult, challenging, and fun. And at the end of the day, first of all, you start, we start from a place of love. You got to start, you know, because there are times where there are certain decisions that have to be made that affect, you know, people's livelihood. Um, there are disagreements that come up. You have four women. We are four women. We are four strong women. We're four opinionated women. And so you learn how to navigate that. At times, it's difficult. At times, decisions have to be made um, in consensus. And so uh, we try, we meet once a month, we meet month, once a month. And if something is really, you know, important, then we'll meet sooner. But um, we meet once a month, we have an agenda, we have to-do lists that we're supposed to be doing. We have checks and balances to make sure things are done. Um, and we have to communicate and sometimes it's difficult because sometimes you don't want to communicate. You may, you know, have things that you don't want to say because you're afraid you're going to hurt people's feelings. But if you don't say it, what you feel, then what happens is that you internalize it and that it becomes bigger, 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 bigger. And then all of a sudden you're walking around with a person that doesn't want to talk, that wasn't, doesn't want to be involved. And so um, it's important to have those meetings, farm meetings, and it's important to provide a space 
where you can be authentic and honest. And even though it may hurt feelings, but you have to be honest to make it work. And so, yes, it's, it's, it's difficult, but so far we've learned to manage because then at the end of the day, when we're either exhausted or we're crying our eyes out, um, we all end up saying how much we love each other, how much we, you know, work together, want to work together, you know, going back to our mission and our vision of who we are, um, and making sure that we leave loving each other. And I think that's really, really important. Um, you know, we came into farming as friends, and I know in some instances it doesn't work out. You know, when you work with friends, you know, two things, the two worst things to do is work with family and friends. You know, they tell you that all the time. Um, but what we try to do is be honest, you know, and sometimes honesty hurts. But you can't leave that hurt, you see, because sometimes people say things and they, and they hurt and they leave the hurt. And when you leave the hurt, there's never closure. And so you wind up being bitter. And so what we try to do is that when there is hurt, to acknowledge that, but then make sure that we come together and end it and end it with love and healing. And that just leave it raw. Um, because I've seen that done. I've seen people say things and, you know, and they leave that open wound and they never close it. They just leave it and they walk away never repairing it. And so we make sure that when things are said that it's hurtful or when decisions that are made that we don't agree on, that in the end of the day, that we acknowledge that hurt, we acknowledge that disappointment in the way that things didn't go your way, and that um, that we always make sure that that wound or that disappointment is taken care of, um, because if not, then it, it can destroy a relationship. You know, it, it can it can des destroy you know, your, your business relationship. And so, um, and we had that in the beginning because we had that when you know before Rise and Root, there's four of us. We had six, so it was not only Jane, Michaela, Lori, myself, but there was Dee and Maggie. So it was six of us in the very beginning. And Dee and Maggie made the decision to go their own way to do Rocksteady up in Milliton, New York. And so that was hard. You know, that was hard because we all we thought that we were all going to farm together. And at the last minute, they decided that they wanted to farm on their own. And again, working on going through that, that traumatic break and how that would affect our farm. Um, it took a lot of time, but again, we constantly talk through it. We constantly made sure that, you know, we would still remain friends. We constantly looked at our farm as sister farms, you know, so it happens. Um, it, it happens and there are difficult, there are times where it's difficult, but at the end of the day, you know, um, your friendship and love prevails. Um, so that's how we deal with it. I think you use the term closing the hurt. Um, right. Closing the hurt. I guess I can, I can, I can imagine in a vague fuzzy way what that looks like, but can you, can you give me an example of, of what closing the hurt has actually looked like that rise and root farm you know, a situation that developed and then, and then how it was, how it was resolved, how it was made so that people could, could move forward effectively in partnership. Yeah. So, um, okay. So look with D and Maggie, when they decided that, you know, cause we didn't know what was going on and, you know, at the last minute, you know, they come and say, well, you know, we decided we're going to, you know, go our own and um, purchase this, purchase this land up in Milliton. You know, at first, first it's like silence. 
It's like, you know, we didn't know, you know, when did you make the decision? How do you make the decision by yourself? Um, so, but we talked through it, you know, we talked through it, you know, and, and they came, first of all, you know, we had a conversation over the phone, but then they came down and we met in person and we talked about it. You know, why did this, why they felt that, that this decision was made, um, that it was an opportunity for them. You know, the decision was made because they were, they were given an opportunity that they had to jump on. And they only had a few weeks to make that decision. And if they didn't make that decision, then that dream or, or that opportunity would be lost. And so on one hand, you're upset because, you know, this, we decided we're going to farm together. But on the other hand, they were given a great opportunity that, you know, you, if you have to put yourself you know, our place. So we said to ourselves, well, if we were given that opportunity, what will we do? You know, will we grab, you know, will we grab onto the opportunity as well? And so putting yourself in their position of giving an oppo- a once in a lifetime opportunity to be owners of a farm that they were managing during the summer and getting the help that they had for people on board to help with capital to help with them getting it started. You know, again, it's something to think about. And then having the talk within ourselves, the four of us, of yes, number one, we're hurt. That's number two, they didn't tell us to the last minute. But then the fact that they were given an opportunity that they couldn't pass on. Well, we, you know, and putting ourselves in their place made us understand. And then when they came down, together to talk to us, to hug us. We cried together, you know, but in the end, we looked at it, you know what? We're happy for them. You know, we're still connected. We still work together. We're, we're sister farm. You know, we still share resources. We still share, you know, they still come down and help out on a rise roof farm. We still go up there to help out on Rocksteady, we realized that it made us stronger. It made us stronger. So in that instance, yes, we felt hurt. Yes, there were hurt feelings. But then we put ourselves in their place. And then we cried and we hugged. And then we started to look at the bigger picture. How in essence, even though they're not part of Rising Root, that Rocksteady is still part of who we are in terms of community and how we still work together and how we still still uh, share resources and how we still visit one another and how we still sleep over. You know, we sleep over at Rocksteady, Rocksteady sleeps over in, in Chester. So, you know, again, that, that wound that was open, how we got together and how we closed it. And so, Again, I mean, and, and it takes big people. Now, now, let me tell you, there are some people who are stubborn. There are some people who are stubborn and set in their ways, and they don't want to forgive. You know, they don't want to forgive. And so they, they, they continue to move on with that hate or, or that resentment. And let me tell you some hate and resentment eats at, it, it, or revenge. It will, eat, it will eat at you. It will eat at you because if you see that person, Again, it stirs up that animosity. It stirs up that feeling that doesn't feel right. And so we wanted to have, be a place where when we see Mag, Maggie and Dee, you know, we want to feel right. You know, we want to hug them. We want to, you know, engage in them. And so whenever they're, you know, if you don't close that wound, if you don't close that wound, you have that bitterness. And the bottom line is that you're left with that. You are the one that is left with that pain and that bitterness. The other person may not even feel it, but you're left with that. And that eats away at you as a person. And who wants to live their life with pain and guilt and resentment that continues to eat away at who you are as a human being? You know, that's, that's, that's a hard life to live. That's a hard life to live if you are continue to live 
with pain and resentment and hurt. And if you don't find a, a place for healing to take place, then you are going to develop ulcers and you're going to develop. It's not a good place to be in. I'm sorry to say it's not a good place to be in um, to hold to hold all that baggage and to continue to hold it year after year after year because you never made closure. You never closed that wound. And so, you know, if you people out there that are listening, you got to close that wound, you know, because you as a person, you're carrying on that that infestation, you know, that doesn't make you right as a person. There's something that's still missing. And until you close it, then you're not going to be whole as a person. That's just my two cents. Karen, I mean, it it seems like a a related thing that you mentioned, related but tangential thing that you mentioned earlier was this idea of, of checks and balances that you guys have in place to make certain that the work gets done. Can you talk mm-hmm. a little bit more about that? Yes. Yeah, so um, we have a whiteboard up on the farm. For a whiteboard, if not the whiteboard, we have a sheet of things that need to be done and duties that. So what I mean is we have to do lists, you know. So now um, we're trying to get like a a truck. We're trying to get a a ten foot truck so that we don't have to. Um, um, always um, rent out at U-Haul. So we're trying to do that. Um, we're trying to now look at our organic certification. We're trying to think about labor. So, you know, so there's certain dues that each of us are responsible is that we have to do. So we make sure that those things are checked off. Work on the farm, their duties, the things that need to be done on the farm. And so there's a list of things so that whoever comes to the farm early, because we go to the farm at different times. And so if there's water that has to be done, if the greenhouse has to be watered, then that's on the list. If there's new planting that has to be done, that's on the list. And what we do, we initial, put our initial next to that list of duties that need to be done. And then when they're finished, we do, we check, we check it off. And so there's responsibility that all of us have to do on the, on the farm. And so there's a list that goes up of what needs to be done. And then, you know, we see what's on that list and we do it. Um, and like I said, there's checks and balances that um, each of us has to do this responsibility as a whole to take care of the farm. Um, and so, and if, say, for instance, one of us is sick, then, you know, we call each other to make sure that that particular uh, chore that had to be done is, is, is being taken care of. Um, because things happen, you know, people get sick. Dan McHale has, they have kids. And so, you know, sometimes they may have to go and pick up the, the children early because someone is sick. And so they couldn't finish a particular a chore, so we have to make sure that that chore is finished. Um, we have weekends off, so Saturday half, half the latter half of Saturday we have off, Sunday we have off. But um, say, for instance, if um, no one is around in the farm to water the greenhouse, uh, we'll get one of our farming partners to do that, or vice versa. So, say, for instance, if they have a long weekend, they will ask um, us to water the plants in the greenhouse. So there are checks and balances. And then, and then also if, you know, you miss something or you don't show up, you know, we call each other out on it. You know I mean? I mean, fair is fair. You know, if things, if you were supposed to do a particular task and you know, you don't do it, you are held accountable. You know, you are, you are called out. So you just don't let things go without saying something. Because again, that, that's not good too, to let people just fly. You know, you call it out. You know, you were supposed to do this. How come you didn't do it? You know, at least you could have called one of us to take care of it. Um, you know, that can't happen again. So, um, yeah. I really like what you talked about, about having the whiteboard that actually assigns the work to different people or the different people are taking responsibility by putting their initials next to things. And, 
and making that responsibility public because it, I always think that that has a, it like it, it removes the power dynamic from having to, you know, enforce that somebody's keeping their commitments because they've actually made a public statement about their commitments. Right. With that, Karen, I'd like to turn here to our lightning round, but first I need to get a word from one more sponsor. This lightning round is brought to you by BCS America. BCS two-wheel tractors are often mistaken for just a rototiller, but it's truly a superior piece of farming equipment. Engineered and built in Italy where small farms are a way of life, BCS tractors are built to standards of quality and durability expected of real agricultural equipment, the kind of dependability every farm needs. I have worked with BCS tractors for over 24 years, and I wouldn't consider anything else for my small tractor needs. And I am not the only fan. More than 1.5 million people in 50 countries have discovered the advantages of owning Europe's most popular two-wheel tractor. And these really are small tractors with the kinds of features found on their four-wheel cousins and a wide array of equipment. Power harrows, rotary plows, flail mowers, snow throwers, sickle bar mowers, chippers, log splitters, and more. Check out bcsamerica.com to see photos and videos of BCS in action. Karen, what is your favorite tool on the farm? My favorite tool on the farm. Um, so gosh, I love weeding. So I have like this little sort of like a hand tool for weeding. Um, so I sit on my, I have a little cart that I sit on. And so the sort of weeding tool, yeah, weeding tool. Awesome. And what is your farming superpower? Wisdom. I'm the oldest. <laughs> I'm, the, I'm the oldest. That's the wisdom, the superpower, definitely. I like it. And what's your favorite crop to grow? I love Swiss chard. Oh, I love Swiss chard. Really? Why, why Swiss chard? That seems like such a... I don't think that when we've asked this question out of 160 farmers that anybody has said Swiss chard. I know. Well, I, I grow collard greens because that's part of my culture. But what I love to grow is Swiss chard because I can make a mean Swiss chard dish. Oh, Swiss chards with white beans. So saute onions and garlic, okay? And I like a little hot pepper and saute that. Then I cut up the um, the Swiss chard and then I melt the Swiss chard and then saute that. And then if you have, I, use, I usually use a can of white beans and put it in there and put it around. Oh my goodness, delicious. And then once the white beans are in there with the Swiss chard and the onions and garlic, then I take some grated cheese and grate it on top. All right, folks, hit me with that recipe. Let me know how great it is, especially with the kick of the of the hot pepper, be it a jalapeno pepper, you know, a serrano pepper. Hit me up and tell me that you did that recipe and it's slamming. I, uh, I have a Swiss chard fan in the house and I, I think I know what I'm making for dinner tonight. Thank you. Definitely. Finally, Karen, if you could go back in time and tell your beginning farmer self one thing, what would it be? That growing food gives you power. Don't be afraid. Put your hands in the soil. There's a connection. There's a DNA connection to all of us of growing food. So if you have a hesitant about growing food, put your hands in the soil. You'll feel the connection. Growing food gives you power. Karen, thank you so much for being part of the Farmer to Farmer podcast today. This was absolutely excellent. Thank you all and everyone. Happy farming and happy gardening. All right. So wrapping things up here, I'll say again, that this is episode 168 of the Farmer to Farmer podcast. You can find the notes for this show at farmer to farmer podcast.com by looking on the episodes page or just searching for Washington. That's W-A-S-H-I-N-G-T-O-N. The transcript for this episode is brought to you by Earth Tools, offering the most complete selection of walk-behind farming equipment and high-quality garden tools in North America. And by Osborne Quality Seeds, a dedicated partner for growers. Visit osborneseed.com for high-quality seed, industry-leading customer service, and fast order fulfillment. Additional funding for transcripts is provided by North Central SARE, providing grants and education to advance innovations in sustainable agriculture. You can get the notes for every Farmer to Farmer podcast right in your inbox by signing up for my email newsletter at farmertofarmerpodcast.com. Also, please head on over to iTunes, leave us a review if you enjoy the show, or talk to us in the show notes, or tell your friends on Facebook. We're at Purple Pitchfork on Facebook. Hey, 
When you talk to our sponsors, please let them know how much you appreciate their support of a resource you value. You can support the show directly by going to farmer to farmer podcast.com slash donate. I'm working to make the best farming podcast in the world and you can help. And speaking of help, I'd like to start a tractor in thanks to Christopher Kopka and to Mark Johnson for their support of the show. Finally, let me know who you would like to hear from on the show through the suggestions form at farmer to farmer podcast.com and I will do my best to get them on the show. Thank you for listening. Be safe out there and keep the tractor running.